So I want to talk in this video about the denouement of the bourgeois industrial revolution. Um, uh, denouement is when you're like telling a story, you're, you're telling a story, let's say, doing a narrative, and then there's a kind of con uh, climax, and then, and then it goes into the denouement, which is kind of just like the, the lull kind of coasting towards the end of the story that occurs after the climax in the story. And we're, we're reaching the climax in this story about the bourgeois industrial revolution um, with, you know, Owenite uh, utopian socialism. And then there's a little bit more unrest right here, right about that time that I want to talk about. So we're going to talk about kind of the, the peak of the climax. And then it's just going to kind of uh, seems to be slowly coasting to the end of the story. Um, and so this is all part of that, you know, long durée sort of way of thinking about history that I've been trying to emphasize. And we have, uh, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen here. All right. So we have in 1830, so this is right after the failed experiment of New Harmony with Owen and Owen divests himself in, in the, you know, his original cotton mill where he did a lot of interesting experiments there. Um, and now we get into uh, a period of pretty large unrest. So in 1830, the swing riots break out and these swing riots are occurring out in the countryside. And, and this causes an ideological problem for the conservatives like Robert Peel in parliament uh, because with the previous unrest with like the Luddites and other uh, frame breaking sort of uh, activities that, you know, riots, just uh, uprisings, the conservatives could always blame it on, well, you know, this is a phenomenon of, of city life and the poor conditions in, in the city. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, we don't have those kind of problems out in the countryside. You know, and that's sort of the conservative attitude that we need to go back to a more traditional way of doing things. And it's this, it's this metropolitan and, and they might even say bourgeoisie sort of way of existence that's causing all these social problems. <coughs> but, um, but the swing riots totally undercut that ideological perspective and it causes a big crisis um, for the conservatives. Uh, in Parliament. And the swing rioters are breaking threshing machines, but they're just, they're not just uh, popping up out of the blue and, and doing spontaneous riots. They're very organized. And with the Luddites, they would send out from earlier, you know, they were organized as well. And they would send out communiques from General Ludd, you know, and that's where they got their name. But this General Ludd is just like a fictional uh, sort of character. Um, but they had like a political agenda. They were sending out communiques and, and, uh, and creating a kind of atmosphere of terror. The swing rioters pick up on that. They're sending out communiques and I believe their anonymous author is named Lord Swing, uh, which probably refers to the threshing rods that they would use to beat um, uh, you know, the wheat uh, as they were threshing it. Um, but again, creating a kind of terror amongst the, the capitalist agriculturalists um, that were adopting the threshing machine technology. Evidently, Michael's threshing machine has here uh, really taken off and started to gain traction and adaptation, uh, adoption amongst the capitalist agriculturalists. And so lots of 
rural agricultural workers, wage workers, are being thrown uh, into unemployment. And, um, and being unemployed, they start organizing into these uh, swing uh, rioting uh, direct actions where they actually target specific threshing machines and destroy them. Uh, okay, so that causes a crisis in Parliament. Um, the revolution in France continues. All right, so this is all part of that like long durée sort of way of thinking about history. And uh, in 1830, we see that this is not distinct from the overall long arc of the revolution because in 1830, we have the July Revolution, which happens in July. Um, and this is often referred to as the second French Revolution. So if, if 1789 was the first revolution, 1830 is the second revolution. And, um, and just to you know, kind of drive that point home, let you know, it is from 1830 that we get the Delacroix uh, painting of of liberty leading the people in the July Revolution. This is about 1830. This is not this is not a picture of 1789. You know, obviously it's not. Um, there's a there's a surrealism to it, but. But um, this is not about 1789. This is about 1830. Okay. And so the revolution is continuing uh, in France. Um, about this time, now we're back in England, the Poor Man's Guardian is founded, which is a newspaper that's uh, adopting a lot of kind of Owenite ideas, uh, but also more industrial uh, workers sort of rights sort of paper. Um, and so uh, propagandizing the working class to get more organized and to be more politically active. Uh, we have the Labor and Cotton Mills Act of 1831. Uh, this is a modification of, of Owen's original strategy, which then, you know, gets watered down and here's you know some uh, tightening it up a little bit so so parliament is reacting to the conditions on the ground and trying to make the conditions of the workers better so that they make it so that un anyone under 21 is not allowed to work at night and anyone under 18 not to work more than 12 hours so now they're starting to put restrictions on on people uh, under 21 or under 18, and it's starting to look more like a general sort of reduction of the work day. Still very high in, in comparison to Owen's idea of eight hours work, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest, um, but, but getting closer to that ideal. In many ways, uh, as a reaction to the swing riots and to some of the agitation, like from the poor man's guardian in the cities, we have the Reform Act of 1832. And this is a big turning point in the political structure of Great Britain. Um, it extends the vote to any male paying taxes of 10 pounds or more. So this brings in many, many, many more voters. Uh, this is getting close to universal suffrage for males. Um, previously, the franchise was only given to landholders. You had to have title to land uh, in order to vote. This now, uh, many workers, uh, a lot of even wealthy people in cities were not were not allowed to vote if they didn't have title to the land. You know, if they didn't have a certain sort of title, uh, you could be relatively wealthy. Um, you know, maybe breaking into the the middle class and not be able to vote uh, in, in that construction that I gave you of the class structure before. Uh, <clears throat> so this really 
makes it much more of a democracy in the way that we think of democracy in the United States. Uh, it eliminates one of the most undemocratic remnants of the feudal order where your, your, your right to vote is tied to land ownership. All right, so they're severing land ownership and you know, suffrage and genuine citizenship uh, in, elect in the electoral process. Uh, about this time, Owens is setting up uh, uh, the National Equitable Labor Exchange. And what it, what it does, it's a kind of bank that issues banknotes, but they're denominated in numbers uh, or hours of labor. So you could have like a, a note that's like a, a bill, like a dollar bill. But this one says one hour. Another one says 20 hours. Instead of $1 or $20 or 20 pounds, uh, it says one hour, 20 hours. And then people could exchange these notes uh, in order to purchase goods, uh, or they could earn them from somebody by doing so many hours of work. And so it, it uh, is, a, is an idea of creating a currency that is directly tied to labor value so that whatever a number of hours you put in, that's the amount of money you get out of it so that you don't get uh, the surplus labor the surplus value that you're building in during those hours, you're not having that skimmed off the top by the capitalist. Um, you, you know, this is before Marx gave his whole analysis. So Owen is already thinking in terms of labor value theory and trying to eliminate the appropriation of surplus value through these uh, novel notes of, of, of value. Uh, the experiment lasts for a couple of years. Again, this, uh, this sounds, uh, uh, you know, it's very much an experimental uh, sort of thing where Owen is just trying out things, experimenting with it, something, you know, it kind of works for a while then falls apart, uh, but he keeps on going. He, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't let that deter him from continuing to uh, find new experiments and keep, keep uh, seeing what, what is possible. Uh, that's quite admirable and quite inspiring for people like Marx and Engels and lots of other people. Uh, in 1833, we have the 10 hour movement. Uh, the 10 hour movement had already been uh, been in motion. This is workers and um, other people in industrial areas that are trying to promote a 10 hour workday, not only for children, okay, but um, or, or young people, but for adults, so that the workday would be limited to 10 hours for adults, because the adults now are still working, you know, a 25 year old is working 16 or 18 hour days. Uh, it, as long as uh, they, you know, the capitalists running the factory is like, well, how how long can we make the shifts? Let's experiment. You know, that's that's the thing is Owen is experimenting uh, with these these socialistic ideas in the same way that he experimented in the factory, um, or, or that he could have experimented in the factory, but he's taken in a different direction. What the capitalists do in a, in a factory situation is they just keep extending the hours. How long can somebody work before uh, their work becomes devalued? You know, after 19 hours, are they still, you know, are they falling down and, and causing accidents or, or can they work 20 hours? Let, well, let's find out, right? Um, So 25 year olds are working tremendously long hours. So there's the 10 hour movement where it's like, okay, we're just gonna, let's try to get it so that everybody like 10 hours is the limit, which would still work out to like a 12 hour day with lunch breaks and everything. Okay, so, 
the movement hopes uh, this will all eventually extend to all workers, uh, but they are um, they are focusing uh, propagandistically on the children, you know, because that's a good foothold. Um, few workers over 40 in cotton mills. Um, there are few workers over 40 in cotton mills because they can't keep up with the pace of work. So the factory uh, owners, the capitalists, are running the factories constantly, having very long shifts and running at a pace. And, and this is a lot of Marx's theory about uh, variable labor is you can run people very fast and get extra work out of them, even in the same amount of hours, or you can extend the workday and get more work out of them by extending the hours. And you just experiment with some combination of those to get the maximum variable labor. And then you skim off the top that surplus value and you take it for yourself and, and you know, let the, the labor force just live, you know, just keep them supplied enough so they keep on coming back to work. That's the name of the game. Um, but 40 year olds are having trouble keeping up with the pace of work. And of course, Amazon workers are complaining about that today in, in the United States is um, the, the packers and, and the warehouses just have to keep moving so much that it, it just becomes physically exhausting, especially as you know, you get older, uh, you know, getting into your forties or even younger people are having a hard time keeping up with the pace of work. Uh, so a, uh, a factory commission is formed in parliament and begins going around the country inspecting cotton mills and they inspect some other factories and they inspect the coal mines. This is what I was thinking about earlier. Um, and they find uh, clear evidence of the deterioration of the physical constitution of workers like permanent deterioration. Um, they see the production of disease that is often wholly unremediable, like people are permanently disabled from the work that they're doing in the cotton mills. Um, and once these people are permanently disabled, they're partial or they have a partial or entire exclusion from the means of obtaining adequate education, acquiring useful habits, or are profiting by those means when afforded. And what they're looking at is child labor. They're saying that children are being permanently disabled so that they can't even go to school and, and they have no prospects for future employment because they're so crippled by the work that they're doing in the cotton mills. Now, part of this report says, and, and this is what I wanted to remember to mention, is that they, they visited some coal mines and the children working in the coal mines had it even worse. Um, uh, and, and that's included in this report. But, but that's no uh, excuse for the, <laughs> for the cotton mills. It's a pretty damning report. And this is the kind of stuff that is in the footnotes in Marx's Capital. Uh, he refers to, uh, I don't remember if he refers specifically to this report, but he refers to similar reports um, and newspaper articles and things like that uh, throughout the text. So, the 10 hour movement does have a success in 1883 or 1833. Um, Althorpe's Factory Act um, is, is a kind of moment for celebration for the 10 hour movement because they, they make a big breakthrough. Okay, children ages nine to 12 are limited to 48 hours per week. Okay, so that's 12, uh, uh, that's, uh, what does that work out to eight hours a week uh, for six days? And um, uh, so that's in principle an eight hour workday for on average 
for kids 9 to 12. Children under 9 not to be employed in factories except silk mills or, you know, in as a bill is moving through Parliament, there's all these, these little exceptions that are added for some reason, who knows. Um, young people under 18 not to work at night. Okay, so now instead of, uh, in, instead of uh, the earlier regulations, we have uh, young people, and young people here is, uh, in this context, is people 13 to uh, 18 years old. Um, so they're not to work at night and they define what night means and children ages nine to 13, not to work more than eight hours with an hour lunch break. Okay, so they do have, um, they do have between these two things, uh, an eight hour work day for the the youngest children that are allowed to work. Okay. And children, you know, this youngest cohort have to have a weekly certificate indicating that they've been to two hours of education per day for the previous week. Okay, so that is, this sounds a lot more uh, enlightened than what we've seen in the previous renditions of this. This is a big step. This is a, a lot of progress. And this is where, you know, uh, it used to be the Tories versus the Whigs in Parliament going all the way back, remember, to the time of the Restoration. Um, and, and, you know, those parties didn't stay exactly the same. They evolve over time, but everybody kind of broke up into those two groups. The Tories were more monarchist and more uh, religiously affiliated with the Church of England. The Whigs are more bourgeois uh, city. The Tories are more country. The Whigs are more city people and in, involved in finance or interested in finance politically and um, and also, at, in this time, more supportive of worker rights. And then the Whigs, at, right around this time, start to evolve into liberals and actually end up being called liberals. And so, uh, and then, you know, by the late 19th century, nobody talks about Whigs anymore. They talk about liberals versus conservatives. Um, and liberals are that bourgeois liberal sort of class of politicians that want to put through acts like this that make capitalism much more reasonable. Okay. Uh, people ages 14 to 18 not to work more than, than 12 hours per day. Um, and now there's a, a, an institution. Uh, and a factory inspectorate, which is a department of the government that systematically will inspect um, the, the uh, factories. Now, and this is, not, uh, this is not just cotton mills either. So this is another aspect which I should, I should indicate in my bullet point so I remember to say this, uh, is this is not just about cotton mills. Now, this is about all factories all employment. So now we really have child labor laws. Up until this point has been restricted to cotton mills or textile industry. Now we're getting child labor laws that are that are universal. <clears throat> I don't know, I'd have to look at the details here. I don't know if it applies to coal mines though, which is which is um, just something that I'm starting to piece together here. Okay, so uh, so that, that's a big that's a big um, that's a big win for you know the socialist movement that's just emerging, right? 
people aren't even using the word socialism necessarily. They're just talking about these ideas. And uh, Robert Owen is a big proponent of this. And other people have varying versions of that. Um, and this is, this is a success, OK? Um, not entirely what is desired, but, but a big win. OK, so let's cut this video off there. And I will see you in the next video.